Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, today I think I have the guest that is in closest proximity to me. With me today is Carlos Olivas. He is in Sacramento. I'm about an hour away. So that's highly different than the guy from Australia or Israel. So thanks for joining me, Carlos. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good. Thank you so for having me on the, you're, on the show. You're welcome. So Carlos and I have something in common, um, obviously both caregivers, but we also lost somebody close to us and had to deal with those feelings while also caregiving for somebody who didn't remember that we'd lost somebody close to us. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to, you know, grieving while caregiving. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, Carlos, who you're taking care of, and then we'll go into talk about your brother a little bit. Sure. Um, like you said, my name is Carlos Olivas. I'm uh, based in Sacramento, California. And I care for my dad, who is living with Alzheimer's dementia. 2015, I got a phone call from my dad's dentist uh, telling me about observations that they've seen with my dad's health and uh, behaviors and thought it was uh, of concern that I needed to be brought in and understood that there's a possibility of of advancing his health to his primary care physician and that's what we did we uh, took my dad to the primary care physician uh, my brother went with them that day explained to him what was going on what we were observing what uh what uh, challenges that has um uh, developed and my dad was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and prescribed a medication to slow it down and that was it we were there was no real guideline of what steps to take next what uh what if there was a referral or the process of moving forward to treat my dad with this diagnosis and what we kind of figured out is that we had to figure it out on our own we were all alone with no resources understand trying to understand what mild cognitive impairment is and what leads what what's next is it another is it a dementia is it alzheimer's those things were on the horizon we didn't know it's I interesting. began to move so home. I, sorry. I began to move home in 2016 and began my journey as a male caregiver. Which that's where I haven't talked to too many male caregivers. And I haven't talked to many male caregivers that take care of a male loved one. But what I find fascinating is your dad's dentist noticed something. Which if you was he going twice a year like we're supposed to? Yeah. He's going twice a year and he was missing appointments. There was other noticeable um, hygiene challenges with the oral health that could also lead to a dementia. And then there was uh, other behaviors that they thought it was of concern. They dealt, they deal with a lot of elders and care for them with compassion and empathy so they have some understanding of what to look for enough to give me a call and say this is what's going on we are concerned for him this is not the first time <laughs> well that's awesome because i don't think i've ever heard that kind of story and i've been doing this for almost seven years <laughs> it's like Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard a lot of stories. But I want to point out 
that today we are recording this on January 30th, and today is a first in an episode, is that I interviewed a doctor who put his residency on hold to work with a company called Alericare to help caregivers get matched with resources, starting with doctors in the doctor's offices. So it's a tool for doctors, it's a tool for caregivers. So you and I both could have used that back in 2016, 2017. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I look back, it's like, what could be different then? How could I have been brought up to speed and educated on how to proceed with my dad? Yeah, and it seems like such it, a simple thing, and it's lacking still. Yeah. Like, the difference is breast cancer versus Alzheimer's. Um, you know, when my, when my actually, not, let me back up. It wasn't breast cancer. It was a kidney transplant that my mom was probably going to need at one point. And they brought in the family. They educated us on what the procedure was going to be all about. They gave us some idea of how to understand this this challenge and all the objections that went with it. That's interesting. We have another. So we have something else in common. Is my dad had a kidney transplant in March of two thousand nine. March not my favorite month of the year for a lot of reasons. The yeah. kidney transplant was fine, but. I was crazy busy with my portrait photography because that's the height of graduation portraits, even though they really should do them in the fall. <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. And my dad died in March 2017. My mom died in March 2020. So yeah, <laughs> don't really like March. <laughs> it's not yeah. the best month. I like warmer weather and less wind. So you said your brother took your dad to the primary care physician. Why don't you tell us about him? Was he older, younger? My brother is four years younger than I am. Okay, that's something else we have in common. My sister's four and a half years younger than me. <laughs> We're gonna have to get together some other. We've Carlos and I have been in the same places at the same time, but we've never had a chance to just sit and shoot the breeze. We're gonna have to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So tell us about so, your brother. My brother, it's an amazing person. He worked with NASCAR on pit crews, so he traveled around the country. Uh, is as uh, the support staff for the racer so they would load in on a thursday or into a racetrack uh prep up the their their garage and uh, prep up the car get it out on the track for uh testing and qualifying and then uh race day they would race out until either they crashed or they finished and then they would pack up and head off to the next city. That was his life. It was a passion of his. He was living out in North Carolina. And he would come home regularly to come and visit us and support the, the cause of helping out with dad. At one point in my despair, I called him up and said, I need help. I need you to come home. And this was after me being home, me going through hair pulling arguments with dad, just, I was at my wits end. I was completely frustrated, discombobulated, and really didn't know how to proceed without support. So he came home 2019 and began the multi-generational home of me and my brother and my daughter supporting our dad. It was rough because we both moved back into the childhood home we grew up in. We both had our, our needs and wants. There was a power struggle. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, we were, we were two strong men supporting another very strong man, our dad, our hero. And we did the best we can. Um, but life is life. 
and there's a lot of ups and downs along the roller coaster ride. And my dear brother passed away in August 2022. So it's been a year and a half ish. Yeah. We are, yeah, it's been a long time so far. And I'm still going through the mourning, the grieving process without my dad. Yeah. Does your dad ask about him? Yes, he asks about him. And he'll say, well, have you talked to your brother today? And I'll say, yeah, I did. He's out with NASCAR on the road. He'll be here soon. He's having fun and he's safe. And that brings my dad some comfort. My dad knows that there is an absence. But if I yeah, can if tell, he lived with you guys for, was it two years? 19, 20, 20, no, three years? Yeah. I'm surprised. No, I guess I'm not totally surprised that he isn't wondering where he is daily. Because he was there and then he was gone. But my, yeah. my mom, I had something similar with my mom. My dad passed away on a Thursday night, about 10 o'clock-ish. And my sister and I showed up the next morning to their home. And she's upset. Caregivers are taking care of her. Um, we took care of a lot of stuff, took her out and everything. By the end of the day, she pff, completely clueless. It was like it never happened, which I expected. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, my grandmother had mixed dementias, starting with vascular from a brain aneurysm that leaked for months. But I've learned that she probably also had something else because of the way the vascular dementia progresses. It's not the same as Alzheimer's. And she and my mom kind of ended up the same way. But there was a day my aunt took care of my grandmother. My, there was one day when my grandmother was horribly upset. She was convinced that my grandfather had left her for another woman. And so my aunt understandably said, oh, no, mom, dad didn't, dad didn't leave you for another woman. Dad died. Pfft. Was that a mistake? <laughs> so then my aunt had to deal with this whole other issue that she had, un, you know, unknowingly created or unwit unwittingly created. So I learned from that experience, don't remind them that they died. And so my mom would always ask, and it was, my parents had kind of a rocky relationship. So she would always ask in this tone of voice, does my husband know where I'm at? And for a long time, not a long, long time, but too long, I would say, yes, mom, dad knows where we are. And literally two or three minutes later, does my husband know where I'm going? And, you know, that's a really irritating tone of voice. And it's really irritating that she's asking about her husband when it's my dad. And it's just like, you know, it's like a layer cake of irritation. And this one day she asked me this like five times between her room in the memory care residence and the car. By the time we got to the car, I was like, I don't know if I can take this woman out. I'm about to stuck her in the trunk, but I'll probably be able to hear her if I stick her in the trunk. And I grabbed the door handle to the car and it was like I was electrocuted. This bolt of lightning went through my head and I realized, holy crap, I'm not answering her question. So from that day forward, it was like, oh yeah, I saw him at the rotary meeting or isn't he out with George to lunch or, you know, he's volunteering at the Salvation Army. It was like, so I just always answered her question in a way that was reality based, but I didn't remind her that he had died because I wasn't yeah. going through that. And in all of the three years that she was in memory care, there was one time, and I swear my family is terrible about this. We were in the car, thank God the light was red because all of a sudden she just spits out. It was so sad when your dad died. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, thank God. Like I said, thank God I wasn't driving <laughs> or I wasn't moving. And I said, yeah, he was really sick because my dad was diabetic. Um, he didn't take care of the live donated kidney very well. And, you know, you got to take care of your systems or they don't take care of you. And that's what happened with him. And she goes, yeah, it was really sad. Isn't the sky beautiful? And that was it. Like literally a minute, minute and a half. And it was like, God, I wish we could talk about that some more. Like, you know, just, just talk about him. Never got to do that. Didn't get to do that with my sister. So I'm sure that's kind of what you've experienced. You know, you have those days when you're like, God, I miss my brother. I'd love to talk to him about NASCAR. And you can't. Yeah. And you can't. And you can't. You don't dare bring it up with your dad, I, was, I would assume. Yeah. 
I I'm very selective in what I reminisce with regarding my brother. If it's times where we were on Easter vacation at Santa Cruz, talking about adventures that we would have, and yeah, I, I would bring it up because that brings back a really fond memory of us as a family unit having a, a, a spring vacation. And it's a past Those memory. Things, it's not like a recent past. Yeah. And then that, the, you know, that would, you know, spark some lucidity in my dad where he can connect with. And then uh, we're off to a different subject after that. <laughs> yeah, they or never last long. Back, or he'll go back into drawing or talking about some other aspect of his life that he recalls and has uh, a savory for, you know, savoring those moments that he can recall. And, and, and being surrounded by something that's familiar. Mm-hmm. The, the familiarization of, of things that are in common with things that he sees now that he can relate to from his past. Like, you know, going to the river, you go to, after a, a, a trip to the donut shop, we'll have a picnic with our donuts along the river here in Sacramento. And I'll ask my dad questions about his childhood, about his marriage, about his time in the Navy, about art. Uh, and it expands to the point where I'll, I might hear something new. Or he'll just say, my brain's not working very well right now. I don't remember. <laughs> my mom used to say that. She'd be like, oh, I think my brain doesn't work anymore. And it'd be like, is that just a flippant comment? Or is that like an insight? You know, like, does, is she really aware? This was like advanced Alzheimer's. It was like, oh, you yeah. know, I would laugh it off. But there was just a part of me that would be like, Man, I hope she doesn't really understand what's going on anymore. <laughs> I mean, at yeah. that point, she was much further along the progression than your dad is because she wouldn't have been able to, well, she wouldn't have been able to do the drawings that he does, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But did you know that not reminding him that your brother had passed away was a good idea? Because there's always that debate as you know, do we tell them the therapeutic fibs or do we sort of tell them the truth in a gentle way, which I don't know how you do that with, oh, yeah, he died. You know, obviously, you probably wouldn't state it quite like that. Or did you have more of an experience like my aunt where you're like, no, so what was your brother's name? My brother's name was Cesario. Cesario. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, Cesario, he died. You don't want to say, I'm. You did you ever tell you remind him that he died? Yeah, we told him oh. about four times. <laughs> Oh, geez. And I was quite torn up about it because what do I do? Uh, when, I found, when I found out that night on August 20th, it was in the evening time, I did not go to my family right away. You know, usually you go to your relatives, your closest relatives, friends, and acquaintances i sent emails out to my caregiver support facilitators my therapist my doctor i sent an email to my dad's neurologist i threw a lifeline out one for me and one for my dad how was I going to navigate this? I've heard, you know, through caregiver support groups, how you don't really tell um, people living with Alzheimer's that their loved ones passed away or understanding that they can have this repetitive asking about a certain individual because they may have passed in their, uh, along, the, along the lines and they just don't recall that. Mm -hmm. And that could also bring some trauma 
there was a time where I took my dad to the cemetery on, I believe it was Mother's Day. Okay. And we went to visit his, his, his mother and his, his sister that passed away in 1992. And then we went to go visit my mom, who was buried there. And my dad broke down. That was 11 years after the fact. And it seemed like it was just the other day where he became very emotional. And I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know how to handle my dad's emotion. Yeah, I'm sure so that we was hard. Car ride. We went for a car ride to deflect and redirect him. But the whole day afterwards, I could tell something was weighing heavy on him. So fast forward to my, you know, to my brother's death. I threw out that lifeline. One, because I needed support. I needed support from individuals that understood the severity of this situation. Because I, I needed to remain normal. I needed to be strong for my dad, but also compartmentalize <laughs> the traumatic emotions that I was going through. I, I can relate. I felt like I got 48 hours to grieve my dad. And then it was back to business as usual, taking care of mom, dealing with the caregivers. So he'd been on hospice. So we had caregivers in their home 24 seven. Let me tell you in 2017, that was over $700 a day, which was a lot of money. <laughs> it was much, it was significantly more money than the memory care residents. And we all know how much those cost. So just put it into perspective. And it was, it was frustrating because it was like, you know, I couldn't, you know, my paternal grandmother outlived my dad. So he was her oldest son and not, I mean, I have a 32 year old daughter. She's still kicking. So I don't, I have not experienced losing a child. Thank God, since I only have the one, but she sort of acted like her loss was much bigger than mine. And I'm like, it's just different. But I had to deal with her and my mom and the caregivers and my sister. And you probably realize I don't talk about my sister very much because we're not in each other's lives because she's not a very useful person, to put it mildly. So there was all of that. So I literally got 48 hours from you know Friday morning to Monday morning. But Friday, we, we took my mom out and got her... You know, I'm not really sure why we bought her new clothes, but that was like what my sister felt like needed to be done. It kind of did. I don't know why it was a priority that day, but it was fine. Kind of had fun. Um, I, there was I take after my dad, so <laughs> there's things I did. She'd be like, "You're so much like dad," and it was like, and it, it was the only time somebody's actually said that it hasn't been a criticism. So that was actually kind of nice. And my mom had a hair appointment. That was one of the reasons we were both there. And so she, you know, we just kind of. Did things as normal, went out to lunch, and that was that was it. But it was like, ugh, you know, I wished I'd had a support system, therapist, doctors, anybody to <laughs> to throw that lifeline out. So you were very smart to do that. Did they what was what was their suggestions? Take a deep breath. Okay. Oh, is that what they told myself, you? Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> I, you were I, telling me. <laughs> they, they, what came back, um, they ended up all started calling. And uh, the first one that called, I pretty much listened and understood how I needed to reinforce myself with this new chapter new page that was blank and we were going to write it. Um, all the other people that called they either understood what was going on and they were going to let one person take the lead. That oh, sounds smart. On. Caregiver's leaving. All right. Have a good day. 
That's my caregiver. <laughs> Bye. Reality in the recording. <laughs> um, so we might have a kind of cameo appearance from my dad if he comes looking for her or me. So just a heads up. Wouldn't so, be the first. <laughs> yeah. So the support that came in was more just to kind of check on me to make sure that I need, if, I, if there was anything I needed for my mental health or supporting me through the possible lows that I was going to go through. Um, it was more of a, a reaction for me to get you know eyes on me to make sure that I just didn't go off the deep end. <laughs> it was you know reliving all that over again, understanding that it was very important for me to have some focus and some direction. And having really good support on my side, notifying them of what was what could possibly happen. Because I, I just I, I was very devastated. I'm sure. You don't um, expect to so, lose a younger sibling. Yeah. And it's not, that, it, it, it's not how the world is supposed to work. <laughs> and you know, the, there was events that led up to this death that we were kind of, me and my brother were at ends. We, you know, we, my brother was dealing with some addiction problems. Mm. And I had barred him from the house because of his behaviors. For a while there, we, you know, we had, we lost contact with him. And he'd show up and try to, you know, bargain with us, but it wasn't working. He needed help. So a lot of that was weighing heavy on me already. I was in the thick of it. And then him passing was even more devastating. It was very traumatic for me. I'm sure. And I'm sure there's a lot of guilt. Yeah, there was a lot of guilt. I think I had to come to terms with it fairly quickly. I had to really process what was in, going on internally with me. I ended up having a conversation with my brother, asking for forgiveness, asking for support, asking for guidance, realizing that I had to let it out. I had to let it out early. I had to come to terms with this loss and I needed to ground myself and forge forward one baby step at a time. So this was, was, you said August of 22? Yeah. So we were past all the insanity of COVID. I mean, we still a little bit, but not, not like 2020. Yeah. But still, all that was still lingering. Yep. Uh, you go through all these processes. You know, that we were riding the roller coaster ride <laughs> of, of just trying to get along as a family and going through life events, going through the pandemic, trying to live our lives, support our dad, support each other. It was difficult. I don't know if you're aware, my mom died March 31st, 2020. 
One of the reasons I don't have a relationship with my sister is because we've never had any ceremony because she didn't want to do a celebration of life. And my dad, <clears throat> now remember, I take after my dad so I can say this because I'm the same way. Dad is frugal as hell. He was a Marine for four years, so he is interred. He's cremated and interned in a military cemetery that is not close to anybody. It's an hour from where my mom lived. It's in Dixon. So you're you're familiar with that. I don't know yeah, how close that is to Auburn. It's not close to me now. And it's not a place that my mom, it's like, it's not the right place for my mom, except that my dad's there. So we've never done anything. We're talking four years, just about when this comes out. Mom's still here with me. My plan is to scatter her ashes, but the traveling has not happened like I've wanted it to. And it's just, there's days when I feel super guilty because nothing happened and and days it's like, but why was it all like, she still has, my mom still has three living siblings and two daughters and sort of adult grandchild. Well, my daughter's an adult. My niece is almost an adult. She's 18. So it's like, why did it all come down on me? And it's, it's challenging. So my mom's birthday was a couple weeks ago and it just, just knowing that date, it just kind of weighs heavy. It's like, gosh, she would have been 81. She should have been hanging out with the grandkids, doing what she wants. <laughs> So it's, it doesn't, it gets easier, but it doesn't get, it doesn't go away. Right. It's not going away. You just learn how to live with it. It gets easier. I've been able to mourn and grieve on my own away from dad. Unless there's a, a song that comes on on the radio or something and it triggers me. I immediately kind of excuse myself and go to a different room, go take a shower and just bawl my eyes out. I know that I have to give homage to my brother. You know, savor those precious moments, have some positive reappraisal, and gain strength from those precious moments. And we're definitely tested and forged as caregivers, aren't we? Yeah, we are. It's I I when I first came back home to support my dad, I label myself as a supervisor, <laughs> supervising my dad's health, and because I put a, a a stigma on on caregiving, a caregiver. Um, I, there was something about it that just didn't ring well with me. I can see that. It wasn't until I, I went to a caregiver support group that I was very hesitant to go to. It took me several years to even step foot in one. And when I get there, no one looks like me. It's mostly women. And I was the youngest. I was the youngest in my group too, unless an adult child came with the parent caregiver. Um, so I didn't look a lot like the group either, other than it was predominantly female. You would have loved my group in the the um, in person group in Brentwood. There was one time there was three men there. One guy had been a caregiver to his wife. I don't remember exactly what she had. I'm not sure that it was a cognitive disease, but it was still something almost equally as traumatic. And he brought his friend. He's like, you're going to need help. And I was like, wow, I'm so impressed. This guy's been through it and he's bringing his friend. And now he, not only is he bringing, did he tell his friend to go? He's sitting here with him. But the very first That's day of amazing. my, yeah, it was impressive. So there was, you know, it was a very big group, which was better or worse. Is, you know, I mean, I was glad that that many people were coming but sad that that many people needed to come. But then it went online, you know, during the pandemic. And then my mom died. And of course, they decided the Alzheimer's Association added the bereavement group after <laughs> after the time frame that you fit into. Like you could be in the bereavement support group for two years. And they brought it out like 22 months after my mom died. <laughs> so I just became my own facilitator. I have an awesome group. But the very first day that I went, the facilitator said, 
It doesn't matter if your pers- if your person is living on their own or if they're you're living with them or they're living in your house or they're living in a memory care community, you are still a caregiver. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. And that was that was November 2017, so it was about 6 months after my dad died. But you you kind of developed your own I don't know if coping technique is right, but it's it's part of your coping techniques. You want to explain what you've been doing for like the last what is this? A year and a half? You're gonna make me do math mm. again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm already in this anticipatory grief, this ambiguous loss. And learning about that, understanding that. Does it make sense? I mean, in reality, it doesn't make sense, especially when you're dealing with a cognitive degenerative, you know, uh, you know, uh, degenerative brain disorder. My dad. And the events that happened over the last several years. I think this is really important that it really kind of sets the kind of tone of of this um january 26 2020 my daughter tried to take her life oh boy <laughs> so i was in the icu for 48 hours almost 72 hours straight supporting her by her bedside navigating that so there, there was grief there while I'm taking care of dad. And I didn't want to tell dad what was going on. There was a conflict of interest with my brother. He needed, he felt that there was a need to tell him. And then, you know, then that brings in family and other people. It's not that I didn't want to tell, have a secret. I just wanted it a little bit more contained and, uh, and understanding how it can have an impact on my dad. So that was that was a smart insight on your part. It it, it was. It just didn't work out well, <laughs> um, because it also created some uh, apprehension between me and my brother and some family members. So fast forward to August. 2022 my brother passed and i go through that process what helped me was compartmentalizing that relying on support system i at the time i belonged to six caregiver support groups oh my goodness (laughs) six is a good number (laughs) it, it some people say well isn't one enough? I go, well, if, you know, is one, is it enough? You know, having six gives me a little bit more, a uh, better perspective because of the, the variances. Mm-hmm. Um, I could have, you know, I, the one support group is once a month. Some others are every other uh, two weeks. Uh, another support group is uh, faith-based. Another support group meets once a month, and we are cr- a creative home writer support group. Another support group is once a week. So I got a pretty much a flow. I, I'm able to not only get support, but also give support to others who are in the midst of their own journey. When did you start the gratitude challenge? The gratitude challenge I started, well, it was 51 days before my brother's 51st birthday. That gratitude challenge was a part of the healing process. You know, take, take insight of what gratitude is. I uh, I had a perspective of what gratitude is. 
before mm-hmm. I became a caregiver. And then after learning more about what gratitude really is, and then going through the loss of my brother and exploring that even deeper. It was it was a place of solace for me where I can embellish in the gratitude of appreciating savory moments that really enlightened me. And it was part of this grieving process that sparked a curiosity to learn more about me and to ground myself in a foundational plateau of love. Self-love? I'm working on it. Yes. Self-love, <laughs> self-appreciation, self-compassion. I think that's the hardest one. And self-forgiveness. You know, surrendering to yourself and understanding that the world is small. Yeah, we met on Instagram, and yet we live an hour away, and then we bump into each other at Alzheimer's Association events. (laughs) Yeah. And we'll have many more times to get together. This is true, because I'm determined to get out of the uh, downstairs office and get out more into the world. Right now, the world is fighting back against that one, but that's okay. I will prevail. (laughs) Yeah. I might have to join you for the donuts by the river when it's warmer. Yeah, when it's warmer, it's really nice to get out. And it's a simple little act. It's similar to what I did with my mom. I would take her to a park to watch kids. I would take her to the swimming pool to watch kids. So we were like creepy old ladies stalking on little kids. (laughs) She was a mom and a grandma, and that made her happy. And that was the only activity I found that was relaxing and happy making for her. So that's what we did. And I was... I take my my dad to the Sacramento Zoo. And my dad loves seeing little kids running around with big smiles on their faces looking at animals. My mom would have liked that. Where we lived... Oh, excuse me. You're fine. Where we lived, we didn't have a zoo. Not close. The Oakland Zoo would have been the closest, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and taking my mom very far in the car was you know, about 10 minutes in. She'd be like, where are we going? <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. I didn't want to remind her, we're going to the dentist. And we've been in the car for seven and a half minutes. So, <laughs> stop. Yeah. So, are you still doing the gratitude challenge? Because I know we've got caregivers that are. Yeah. I write into my journal. <laughs> Purple I journal. journal. <laughs> Yeah, it's a purple journal. It's one of many. I've had different types of journals, and this was gifted to me, so I took advantage of it. And before bed, I jot down three things that I'm grateful for for the day as a way to release my thoughts, focus on the gratitude, and appreciate my life. It seems like our brains and, are really good about circling the the crap that's happened. Your dad not wanting to shower or, you know, like technology trying to mess my world up. You know, and it's just, sometimes we just get caught up in that negative loop. And both my dad and I, we live in the negative loop if we're not careful. So I have a... And you've probably seen this that I've shared this on Instagram occasionally is I have an addition to the gratitude challenge. So you can try this tonight. And I think it sounds like you're kind of doing it a little bit, but you should always, at the end of the day, find at least one thing to be proud of yourself. It could just be as simple as, oh, God, I got through this day and I didn't kill anybody. (laughs) Nobody died on my watch. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, you got through your to-do list or you said the heck with it, tore the to-do list up. You didn't lose your mind when the 
poop hit the fan literally or figuratively. <laughs> and yeah. I find that to be really helpful because we were discussing earlier where it, it's, it's compassionate. It's like, we do a lot of stuff. You know, you do a little bit more than I do because you, you're taking care of your dad. I just have to take care of a golden retriever. <laughs> so, uh, but she's kind of demanding and it's, you know, but some, there's just times it's like, oh, I didn't get this done or, oh, we're having leftovers again or I'm having cereal for dinner. You know, it's like we can always find all the baloney. But if we take a step back and say, you know, what did I do that was really good today? What, what did I accomplish today? Or what do I have to be proud of myself today? On top of the gratitude, I think would really help shift our minds into a positive place. Yeah, it does does transform you a little bit if you're proud of that maybe it's one thing maybe you didn't talk to somebody because you wanted to protect your mental health or you got caught up in the mind traps and you dug yourself out of it you got yourself into a good position where you can close your eyes and be comfortable and safe that that's taken me a long time to get to where I'm practicing it often. Um, mastering trying to practice is where I'm at. I'm not a master. I'm just trying to practice. And hey, doctors are practice, still practicing. <laughs> that practice takes a lot of discipline, especially when you're a caregiver and that you have a lot of distractions going on, some chaos. But if you can really squeeze out that joy and excrete that spark of love, I, I, I feel at the end of the day with dad, if I can ask him, what are you grateful for? And he says, oh, my two sons and my granddaughter, and they take good care of me. I know that he is safe. He is loved. And he's still honoring my brother. And I feel content that we get to preserve his dignity. Yeah. And your brother's still there. He's taking care and of you guys brother, somehow. My brother's still here. He's taking care of us. And that's one thing that my brother didn't want to happen. He didn't want to be forgotten. And this is one way that I feel my dad can pay homage to him. Yeah. Did your brother verbalize not wanting to be forgotten? Yes, he did. Wow. Yeah, that was one of his fears. That was one of the things that he feared that my dad was going to not remember him. Um, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are afraid to get educated on about Alzheimer's and, and related dementia is that they feel that it's, it's, a, it's memory loss. But Alzheimer's is, is a full body thing. It's mm -hmm. just not memory loss in the brain. It's basically your brain losing memory how to operate your your internal organs and having muscle memory uh losing smell and taste sensations in your fingertips or even feeling like you're being stabbed in the shower <laughs> from the from the water drops they get scared easy mm -hmm. they're fearful and then that turns into other challenging behaviors. Yep. Um, there is a lot of things that we, myself included, I still don't know. I'm learning about dignity. My caregiver could calls me out and says, Hey, you need to do better. <laughs> you need to, you know, recognize dignity. But how do you recognize that? How do you do better when you're 
under duress, how do you keep focus? How do you deflect and redirect yourself back onto the tracks? That's what we have to practice every day. Every day. I have a constant reminder to do better. To uphold my dad's quality of life and preserve his dignity. And what I know about dignity eight years ago is much different from what I know now. Oh, I'm sure. I can, I can see um, the totally different definitions, like, clearly in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's evolving. Even understanding your own dignity. Um, I agree. My, I, I uh, had an injury in uh, August 2023. Injury is an understatement. Uh, it was a major traumatic injury. I had a work-related injury, and I was taken out for a good three and a half, four weeks. I was away from the house for three weeks in rehab. I was getting well enough to navigate home with a broken leg. Not just a regular broken, broken leg. It was a plateau, a fractured plateau tibia, which is a very severe injury. And you got I'm pins and in, plates, still, right? Yeah, I got pins and plates. and I feel kind of abnormal and I have feel like I have a really weird growth inside. Do you but feel it when it's about of, to rain? No, I oh. do not feel temperature changes. I do not feel any of those weird things that people talk about. Because I have a plate on my collarbone from flying off my bicycle in 2016. It's gotten better, but every so often it feels like a headache. But we are totally out of the grief talk and into something that we probably have to do a whole other episode on. And yeah. um, do you have a last tip for people on how to get through your own grief while kind of masking that the, the loss didn't happen to your loved one? Yes. The last tip is to resort to support. Having a care team in place to jump in when the house is on fire. <laughs> That's Not just to pick up the phone and call the fire department. I mean, literally to run in and support the people that need support. Get them out of the house. Get them into a safe zone. Literally be there for them. Yeah, that's what I did. I didn't have that either time. And losing somebody at the start of COVID and the shutdowns and all of that insanity we lived through in 2020 was... It was an entirely different experience than when my dad had died three years earlier. Like, yeah. opposite. So, I appreciate this. If you guys want to hear more from Carlos, I think that's going to be a, be something you can do. So, thanks so much for joining me, Carlos. And I think we're going to have to do this again about dignity. Yeah. Uh, it is a journey. And we just got to take one step at a time. At this moment in this life. I agree. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.